Extract 1, questions 1 to 12. You hear a consultant rheumatologist talking to a patient called Suzanne Hines. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Afternoon, Mrs Hines. Uh, now, you've been referred to me by your GP. That's right. OK, so I've got some notes here with his referral letter, but it'd be helpful if you could tell me in your own words about the problems you've been having. Well, I've been having various symptoms recently. Apart from generally feeling tired, I've started noticing how chapped my lips were. I'm always using lip salve. Then, on top of that, I began getting quite a few mouth ulcers, and they're mm -hmm. really sore. Oh, and something else. I've always gone regularly to the dentist and... Well, I used to have the odd filling, but now she keeps finding dental cavities, so I'm always having them done. I see. Uh, and does your mouth feel dry? Yes. I I'm always sipping water to try and help, mm -hmm. but it doesn't really. And my tongue started hurting. I noticed in the mirror it looks... Well... Uh, cracked is the way I'd try to describe it. My whole mouth feels different. Mm, and you've had some eye problems too, I gather. Oh, yeah, they feel dry too. But then some mornings when I wake up, my eyelids themselves feel, well, sticky. Mm. The skin area around my eyes itchy too, and I end up rubbing it. I mean, it's particularly bad when I'm somewhere with air conditioning, like at work. Mm. And have any over-the-counter treatments helped? <sighs> Well, I don't fancy putting ointment round my eye, but mm. I do use eye drops, which help, though the effect soon does wear off. I wonder if the drops are causing other problems, like I keep on getting conjunctivitis, right. and people mention how tired I look. It's so embarrassing. Uh, and what about your vision? Is that affected? Well, I must say, strong sunlight really does bother me now. I use sunglasses a lot more than I did, and, well, yeah, thinking about it, things do look, well cloudy occasionally and that worries me a bit actually yeah it must do um is there anything else you've noticed um what about your throat well it's not really sore as such but from time to time it feels what i call rough and when i eat i've always got to have a drink to hand it can be hard getting stuff down otherwise to be honest mm. i've never used to have any problem swallowing food but i do tend to panic now if i haven't got something to drink while i eat I don't know if I'm imagining it too, but I could swear my throat's a bit swollen. It's hard to remember how it was before. Mm. Uh, and is this affecting your job? Is it making things harder at work? <laughs> Tell me about it. My voice is often strained anyhow, as well. I'm a tour guide, so right. talking most of the day. But everything's making that worse, and I often struggle to be heard. And, well, lunchtimes are always rushed anyhow, but now it's taking me longer to eat, and I've got less time than ever. I do wonder if all my years as a smoker are returning to haunt me. I mean, though I smoked about ten a day for about fifteen years, it's a good twelve years since I gave up. Oh, well, that can only be doing you good. Um, and what about your family? Do you know of anyone having similar symptoms to yours? No, not that I know of. My dad always smoked and he didn't have any lung problems, as I recall. My gran and aunt suffered from rheumatoid arthritis, though. Uh, well, I do remember that. Right. I don't think I've got that, though. My symptoms are completely different. Uh, well, no, but we do need to check possible links. Um, for example, an autoimmune problem. Um, we'll start by checking your saliva production with what's called a saliva flow rate test. OK, that sounds straightforward. Uh, yes, it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, but I'm also going to recommend a biopsy of your lip, uh, the lower one. Oh, that sounds odd. Uh... What for, exactly? Uh, well, it'll let us see the salivary gland tissue. Um, don't worry, you won't feel anything. It's done under local anaesthetic. 
Um, and you've not had a thyroid function test, so mm. I might recommend that you have one of those, uh, depending on the earlier test results. Mm. Okay, fine. Well, anything that sorts out this problem. I mean, I Um, so, Anila, what has brought you to counselling? So, I've been in a relationship with somebody for about six months. Um, okay. I wanted us to move forward with our relationship and, you know, get married. And he, he's not on the same page as me and that's causing a lot of tension. And then in addition to that, my mother's very unwell. Um, mm. So, I have a lot of things to deal with at home with her as well. And then um, my boss is putting a lot of pressure on me to deliver um, everything on time. And so I'm just having some trouble juggling everything at the moment. Yeah, yeah. And I can see that um, all of these combined are, are making you feel quite overwhelmed. Oh, very. And it's just really, there are some times when I just come home and I have to deal with my mother and I have to deal with my relationship. And then I have to go to work the next day and I'm having trouble with that. And it just makes me really upset. Okay. Yeah. And I'm wondering, Anita, how, um, how long have you been dealing with all of these issues? Oh, um, it's probably ramped up in the last three months, um, but I've been in, the, in my relationship for six months and my mum's been sick uh, for the last three, four months. So it's not that new, but it's, it's now starting to get worse. So Yeah, yeah. Um, so how have you been coping so far with all of these, these pressures? Not very well, <laughs> um, but yeah, I just take it day by day and... Um, yeah, communication is a bit of a difficult one. Like I said, this is my first time doing counselling and yeah. don't really have anyone else I can turn to. So, yeah, yeah. it's very hard. Yeah, um, I, I do understand that it is very hard to, to seek um, support in, in such personal issues, but that's what we're here for and that's what um, we're hoping that we can do with, um, with this session as well. Um, so... Given that this session's um, very different to the other ones, I just wanted to know, you told me that you um, are experiencing some concerns with your partner because you want to move forward and he's not in the same uh, place as you and your mother's quite sick and um, you're looking after her as well so that's an area of concern for you and then you have some pressures with work. Um, so I'm just wondering if we could prioritise any of those concerns, what would the, the biggest concern be? Um, well, probably dealing with my mother and my relationship are probably quite equal. Cause my mother is also putting a lot of pressure on me to yeah. get married. Obviously she's not well, so, um, you know, she wants to see her family happy. Yeah. yeah. Dealing with that situation is probably the number one thing for me at the moment and the work thing I can deal with because I try not to bring work home but obviously that's a bit hard too. Yeah. So when you say dealing with that concern do you mean working uh, the relationship with your mother or the relationship with your partner? Probably with my partner first that's because right. yeah I feel like I'm putting a lot of pressure on him yeah. because of what's happening with my mother. Yeah. Okay, so what we, we can do is, um, if it's okay with you, focus on that area first and we will look at all the areas that are overwhelming you, um, but we can start by working on that, that issue first, if that's okay. Yeah, yep. excellent. Um, so we only have a couple more minutes before the session ends um, and I was wondering if you had any other questions before we, um, we go and sign the contract. and. Um, no, just maybe in terms of the number of counselling sessions I'll need. I know you said that the first six are free, um, but obviously money is a bit of a factor as well. So what happens if I have to go over the um, six sessions? Yep. 
Um, and I do apologise, I said when we'll go and sign the contract, but you already signed it. But um, So if you go over the six sessions, it will be $70 after for each session. Um, and you can, like I said, you can um, continue as long as you need to. So it's really difficult to find a time for every single person and, and have a set time. So we like to see how it goes and together we can work out what the best um, time frame is for, for yourself. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Um, so if you don't have any other questions, we can book another time in next week for you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thanks. I'll, uh, do I speak to reception about that? Yeah, well, I'll come out with you and we can um, sort that out. Great. Thank you. Okay. It was lovely meeting you. Nice and meeting thank you, you so too. much for, um, for uh, opening up and, and having that chat with me. Um, and we'll focus on uh, the, the first um, topic of you and your partner. Okay, thank you. Okay, Thanks very much. Thank you. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you will hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. You hear a doctor and a trainee discussing the application of a plaster cast. So let's discuss the short arm cast that you're going to apply. What are the steps? Well, first I need to examine the area and check the x-rays to see if surgery is needed. For the cast, first I'll apply a stockinette with a hole for the thumb and then I'll wrap the arm in a web drill for padding. After that, I need to immerse the roll of plaster in water. Right. And what should you point out about the plaster? I need to warn the patient that it may feel hot as it starts to set. How long does it take to dry? The cast may feel dry to the touch in a few minutes, but it isn't fully dry for 72 hours. What's the last step? After I've applied the cast, I need to take another x-ray to confirm that the fracture has been reduced. You hear a manager explaining new data management processes to clinical staff. Yes, in the back. You had a question? Yes. Uh, how should we file our feedback reports? Do we need to just complete them on the computer? That's a great question. Remember that since the clinic has begun transitioning to the new computers and software systems, we need you to fill out the paper reports in addition to the digital versions. I know this may be time-consuming, but this is because as we transfer all our files from the old servers to the new ones, some files may be misplaced, and we want to ensure that all of our records are easily accessible at all times. So we need to make two copies of our reports? Yes, exactly. Great. Does anyone else have a question? You hear a presentation about the introduction of a new type of wound dressing. Thank you all for coming. Well, after some research, the hospital has decided to invest in a new type of dressing to care for our patients with chronic wounds, such as those with diabetic ulcers. Although the traditional cloth compression bandages are useful, they need to be changed frequently to promote healing. These new bandages are made of a natural, plant-based material instead. In fact, they're made from seaweed. Allogeneate dressings are somewhat costly, but they can prevent harmful strains of bacteria from entering the wound, 
by forming a protective barrier with the skin. Most impressive of all, they can absorb up to 20 times their own weight, so they're the best choice for wounds with high-level exudate. Based on these factors, we believe that alginate dressing would be a useful addition to our wound care procedures. You hear two hospital managers discussing completion rates for an online course. It looks like only around 40% of the staff have completed the online health and safety course so far. Less than half, but the course has to be completed by all staff members by the end of the month. Can we send them a reminder email? We've reminded them by email twice already. I've even phoned a few people. I think we need to bring it up at the general staff meeting next week. That's on Thursday afternoon, right? Will that work with everyone's schedules? It should. All staff members have that time already blocked out. But if anyone can't come, then we can speak to them in person one-on-one. -on -one. You hear an educator describing methods for creating medical abbreviations to nursing trainees. A technical name for the use of first letters is initialing, but I prefer to use the phrase the first letter rule for this method. Abbreviations using the first letter rule commonly identify diseases and diagnostic tests. For example, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is COPD, or liver function tests are LFTs. In most cases, these letters are pronounced separately as letters, but sometimes key letters or key syllables form the abbreviation. For example, hypertension is abbreviated using HTN, or we see the term atrial fibrillation abbreviated as either AF or AFib. Sometimes the first letters form an easily pronounceable word, an acronym. For example, acquired immune deficiency syndrome becomes AIDS, or severe acute respiratory syndrome becomes SARS. Understanding these principles will help you to more quickly learn the many abbreviations used in local clinical settings. You hear two colleagues discussing an online training course. Hi Fiona, how are you? Can I ask you something? Sure, Mark. What's up? Have you done that online training for a new record management process? Yeah, I did it on the weekend. It was supposed to take 10 minutes, but it took me ages. Did you have any trouble with it? I mean, any technical problems? Not really. I couldn't log in for a bit, but that was just me getting my password wrong. After that, it worked fine. Why? I keep getting this email that says I haven't finished all the activities, and then when I log in, it says I've completed everything. It's driving me crazy. Did you ring the IT help guys? Yeah, they reset it, but it didn't do anything. I really don't want to do it again. Mm, no, you shouldn't have to. Maybe just send the register an email and let her know that you've done it. Maybe she can fix the issue. Extract 1. Extract 1. 
questions 31 to 36. You will hear an interview with a dietitian called Ben Melrose, who's talking about iodine deficiency. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. My guest today is a dietitian called Ben Melrose, and today we're going to be talking about iodine deficiency and some of the medical consequences of that. Ben, iodine is a trace element that's found in many foods. Mm. Why do some people not get enough? Well, in some parts of the world, this is an endemic problem, and it's not a question of dietary choice. We get iodine from various sources, like there's iodine in eggs and dairy foods, but by far the biggest source is the ocean. Fish that live in salt water and plants that grow in that environment are our main source of iodine. So we see relatively few cases of deficiency in Europe, for example, because such foods are plentiful there. But elsewhere, typically in the middle of large continents, it's a different story. There, people simply don't have access to sources of natural iodine. Obviously, poorer people in those regions are most likely to suffer deficiencies, but everyone's affected to some degree. And the consequences of iodine deficiency can be quite serious, I imagine. Yes. Uh, classic symptoms are things like muscular weakness, not being able to focus on the task in hand, and also a tendency to feel cold, even in hot weather. But the most widely reported symptom is actually a feeling of constant tiredness. Oh. Of course, there are tests that can determine the level of iodine in the body and 150 micrograms is regarded as the minimum daily intake needed to avoid symptoms. And there are related conditions. A typical one is an enlarged thyroid, what's often called a goiter. So you've worked in South America, Ben, mm. where, where um, I think it's quite common to see patients with a goiter. That's right. The case of one of my own patients illustrates this very well. Let's call her Mirabelle. Mirabelle's a middle-aged woman whose home is high up in the Andes Mountains. She lived in Europe for a number of years, where she enjoyed a varied diet and good health. When she and her husband went back to their native country, however, they returned to a remote region and tended to revert to the local cuisine, which is lacking in iodine. As they hadn't suffered any of the symptoms of iodine deficiency before they left for Europe, they didn't feel any particular need to worry about their diet now. But I believe she developed a goiter. Well, what happened was she started to have problems sleeping. She'd wake up in the middle of the night with discomfort in her legs, and then she started to get a sore throat. At first, she assumed it was flu, but the symptoms persisted. Then one day, she noticed a slight swelling on her neck. At first, she couldn't believe it. The family were eating lots of river fish and fruit, so a diet that was healthy enough in many ways, but crucially lacking in iodine. Mm. Knowing this, she'd been taking multivitamins since her return, so was initially sceptical until a test confirmed that this was the cause. So, were you able to help Mirabelle? I was able to work out a diet for Mirabelle that made the most of the natural sources of iodine that were available to her. I also encouraged her to eat Brazil nuts. These are a good source of selenium, which actually helps the body to absorb the traces of iodine which are present in other foods. Oh. I also advised her to steer clear of certain processed foods, like bread made with flour improver, because these actually impede the body's ability to absorb iodine. I left it up to her whether or not she continued with the multivitamins. Mm. So, what conclusions do you draw from Mirabelle's case? What it made me think was that millions of people on this planet must be existing on the brink of iodine deficiency. And that's a cause for concern. Like Mirabelle, when you're young, the body can cope. But this takes its toll with time. Another thought I had was, did Mirabelle become more susceptible to the effects of iodine deficiency as a result of the iodine-rich diet she'd enjoyed in Europe. 
I couldn't say, but that certainly seems to warrant further study. Now look at Extract 2. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear a clinical psychiatrist called Dr Anthony Gibbons giving a presentation about the value of individual patients' experiences and stories in medicine. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Hello, my name's Anthony Gibbons. I'm a clinical psychiatrist and published author. I'd like to talk about something that's relevant to all medical professionals, the use of narratives in medicine. Let me begin with a case study sent to me by a colleague who shares my interest in the subject. The study featured a 30-year-old man who was hospitalised for severe panic attacks. He was treated with narcoanalysis, but feeling no relief, turned to alcohol and endured years of depression and social isolation. Four decades later, he was back in the psychiatric system, but for the first time he was prescribed the antidepressant Zoloft. Six weeks later, he was discharged because the panic attacks and depression had disappeared. He lived a full life until his death 19 years later. If the narrative was striking, it was even more so for its inclusion in a medical journal. Repeatedly, I've been surprised by the impact that even lightly sketched case histories can have on readers. In my first book, I wrote about personality and how it might change on medication. My second was concerned with theories of intimacy. Readers, however, often use the books for a different purpose, identifying depression. Regularly, I received and still receive phone calls, people saying, my husband's just like X, one figure from a clinical example. Other readers wrote to say that they'd recognised themselves. Seeing that they weren't alone gave them hope. Encouragement is another benefit of case description, familiar to us in an age when everyone's writing their biography. But this isn't to say that stories are a panacea to issues inherent in treating patients, and there can be disadvantages. Consider my experience prescribing Prozac. When certain patients reported feeling better than well after receiving it, I presented these examples first in essays for psychiatrists and then in my book, where I surrounded the narrative material with accounts of research. In time, my loosely supported descriptions led others to do controlled trials that confirmed the phenomenon. But doctors hadn't waited for those controlled trials. In advance, the better-than-well hypothesis had served as a tentative fact. 
Treating depression, colleagues looked out for personality change, even aimed for it, even though this wasn't my intended outcome. This brings me to my next point. Often, the knowledge that informs clinical decisions emerges when you stand back from it, like an impressionist painting. What initially seems like randomly scattered information begins to come together, and what you see is the bigger picture. That's where the true worth of anecdote lies, beyond its role as illustration hypothesis builder and low-level guidance for practice, storytelling can act as a modest counterbalance to a narrow focus on data. If we rely solely on evidence, we risk moving toward a monoculture, whereby patients and their afflictions become reduced to inanimate objects, a result I'd consider unfortunate, since there are many ways to influence people for the better. It's been my hope that, while we wait for conclusive science, stories will preserve diversity in our theories of mind. My recent reading of outcome trials of antidepressants has strengthened my suspicion that the line between research and storytelling can be fuzzy. In medicine, randomised trials are rarely large enough to provide guidance on their own. Statisticians amalgamate many studies through a technique called meta-analysis. The first step of the process, deciding which data to include, colours the findings. Effectively, the numbers are narrative. Put simply, evidence-based medicine is judgement-based medicine in which randomised trials are carefully assessed and given their due. I don't think we need to be embarrassed about this. Our substantial formal findings require integration. The danger is in pretending otherwise. I've long felt isolated in embracing the use of narratives in medicine, which is why I warm to the likelihood of narratives being used to inform future medical judgments. It would be unfortunate if medicine moved fully to squeeze the art out of its science by marginalising the narrative. Stories aren't just better at capturing the bigger picture, but the smaller picture too. I'm thinking of the article about the depressed man given the drug Zoloft. The degree of transformation in the patient was just as impressive as the length of observation. No formal research can offer a 40-year lead-in or a 19-year follow-up. Few studies report on both symptoms and social progress. Research reduces information about many people. Narratives retain the texture of life in all its forms. We need storytelling, which is why I'll keep harping on about it until the message gets through. That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.